All right, welcome everybody. Appreciate you all joining us today. Um, at this time, we will call to order our Conroe ISD School Safety and Security Committee meeting. Uh, appreciate you all being here today to be a part of our committee. Uh, and for those of you that are watching later uh, as well, just as a reminder, this is a uh, public meeting and we will share uh, appropriate information um, with the public. There, there will be some information that we may, we may uh, need to not share publicly as to you know, maintain the security of our uh, campuses. So if you, if there are, there could be questions that could come up today that we might would uh, defer our answer to a later time uh, or a future executive session. So just uh, to make everyone aware of that, we, um, we want to be mindful as we move forward. Um, I will share my screen here and, and just share the agenda um, for today's meeting so that we can all see that. Our first item uh, today is to uh, consider the approval of the minutes from the School Safety and Security Committee meeting from back on December 8th. So I would uh, entertain a motion at this time to uh, approve those minutes. I think they were all sent to you via email. Dr. Noel, I'll make a motion, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. McCord. Uh, a second? Mrs. Wagaman, thank you for the second. Any conversation, uh, corrections that need to be made to the uh, to the minutes. All right. All those uh, in favor of approving the minutes as presented, please raise your hands or key in. They're perfect. Anybody opposed, please make your voice heard. Thank you. So the minutes uh, are approved. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I think Mr. McCord will be sharing his screen as we move into our uh, act or, um, agenda items today. Uh, agenda item number two, receive information about and provide input regarding the perimeter required door numbering. Uh, and I believe that Ethan Barton, our school safety coordinator, is going to make that presentation to us today. Yes, and there's some information in that PowerPoint, Mr. McCord, if you don't mind sharing it. Um, what it comes down to is it's proposed legislation, and so it's nothing that's come forward to us yet. And it gives us some pretty succinct uh, direction on how moving forward with new buildings that we're going to have to uh, number uh, those perimeter exterior doors on the inside and the outside. And it says in there that there it is. So though graphically rep represented, um, the front door shall always be zero and they shall be clockwise and then meet the international fire code there. So we have that there. So Really what we're looking for, we have an example right now, one of our newer buildings um, stocked in right there. That's how currently they have them numbered. However, when if this new legislation does hit, we're going to have a way that we have to follow. And so what we're looking for from the committee is if you guys have any input or any recommendations on how aesthetically, et cetera, et cetera, um, you all would feel that these buildings need to be numbered if that legislation should be brought forth. We've had conversations in the past in other committees regarding this, uh, speaking with first responders and such, and uh, their recommendation to us was just number them, make sure it's consistent and let us know. <laughs> However, um, with this kind of on the horizon, we would definitely like some input from the safety committee in regard to that. Well, I think this looks clean, Ethan. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, having it be clean and consistent, this is a nice clean way of doing it. I know sometimes we, we end up with a variety of different things and certainly, um, you know, just having, you know, giant numbers pasted everywhere, kind of discombobulated, not only uh, I think can cause problems for the first responders, it's also just not aesthetically pleasing on every day of the year. So, um, you know, this, this looks like a nice application. Uh, I do find it interesting, the, you know, depending on how that law is written and, and if it passes and comes into play is, you know, we're, we're constantly doing construction on buildings like, you know, what starting at zero and working our way around today can look different six weeks from now when we've done some type of addition or cut in another door or whatever it may be. And what will that cause us to have to renumber the entire building or can you have a 2A here. That'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Right. I mean, it does say on there that they'll include graphically represented numerical characters. So I think it, I think the 2As and 2Bs would be excluded from that. However, it is proposed. So 
that could definitely be written to kind of give that latitude, but we're just not there yet. But, and it does say that the front door is, is zero and it's the only set of doors that does not require the numbering. So of course, once you're starting clockwise, I find that odd as well, that your first door to the right would be number one, but that's just how it's written right now. Yeah. So that's, at Stockton, we'd be, we'd be off by one right there. And we had one on the front door. Yes. Right. Any other comments? I just think it's worth noting too that there are a myriad of things that as a building principal and within uh, operators within the school that having the, the doors number would benefit the, the organization as far as meeting at places, designating specific doors you go out of and making it clear when you have a fire drill or other types of drills. But there, I think there are advantages to having the doors numbered that go past just safety and security. Yeah, maintenance, et cetera. I mean, it's, they do, there's a lot of value to having the doors numbered. Great. And as a building principal, one thing that you're always paranoid about and obsessed with, well, at least I was, was making sure the doors are always functioning and working properly. You get to listen to, you, you get used to hearing the latch, the connection, and uh, being able to number the doors. It's just, there's a lot of positives, both on the inside and outside of the door. So I, I think it will help. Great, okay. Thank my, you all. My thought on that, Dr. Noel and, and Ethan is just out of curiosity, the, the numbering system is great, but that the advice was just number it however you want. I mean, I would think that there would be some kind of communication with other districts on how they're gonna number it to make it easy on the, the in the event of an emergency, that it would be easy on the fire department or the police department to, so they don't have to learn every different district's numbering system. That was just kind of interesting to me that they just said, you know, I don't care how you do it, just the front door is zero. And then from there, you know, put over whatever numbering system you want. I, I, I would think there'd be so a little bit more advice on a, a system to follow. So the, the emergency crews, they don't have to learn every different district's system yeah and, and you're right and i think i may have misspoke i think the conversations that we were having with this particular committee this before the creation of this we kind of gave them two um well we, we put forth two separate ideas on what the door numbering would be and there wasn't any objection to either and so i think that you're right with this proposed legislation coming out it's dictating how we're going to be able to number those doors the clockwise and with the numbers so then every school and every district is going to have that consistency and so you know when you go to school in in conroe and then you go to a school in fort bend for example they're all going to be numbered the same so whoever's mm -hmm. responding to that building is going to have that accuracy so you're, you're absolutely right though and i think that is the intent is to create a standard that hasn't that isn't been in existence. My question is, do we know, Ethan, is it going to apply to outside door facilities like stadiums, football fields? Will we have to number those? That I don't know. Um, Easy, do you have any information on that? Have you heard anything in regard to that by chance? Because it's kind of in the facility standards as well. Yeah, we, we do anticipate a, a very similar requirement coming out in the TEA facility standard in the, in the very, very near future. So legislation or not, we're going to be facing something like this. Now, for outdoor venues, uh, I think it makes sense to be, you know, to carry on a similar uh, uh, issue like at uh, Wood Forest Stadium, for example. We already call the gates something different. We would just need to fall in a consistent, you know, uh, nomenclature so that we start, you know, at one spot, maybe the home elevator and then clockwise number around the stadium. Yeah, I think that becomes that problem is like, what is the front door? And then, you know, how do you number all those gates that we have to number, even though we don't use them, you know, but we'd have to number them. All right. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Item three, receive information about and provide input regarding use of emergency secure lockdown buttons. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'll speak on this one. And thank you for participating in our committee. And uh, specifically today, I'm going to address uh, the uh, emergency secure lockdown buttons, also known as the red emergency secure lockdown buttons. I've chosen to show you 
two images of the buttons that, as they appear across our district and facilities, including the building of which I occupy right now in central office. We have a couple of iterations. One is a button you see on the right and it's emergency and you push the button and it's pretty clear how it works. And then the second button option is a button that we also have installed in separate locations where you flip the lid down and then you push the button from underneath. So there are two iterations, but they're really simple. And uh, that, those are the pictures. We have worked out after starting these initially, we've worked out with front office people, how they were to be conscious of them, uh, our cleaning crew, our night crews, what they do and how you activate them. And after getting off to a start where we had to address a few issues, it's been relatively smooth. We tested one recently, which was useful. Uh, we tested the one here at central office and thankfully, we hope we continue to live in the world and work in a world that we don't have to deploy these. But I want to tell you a few things. And what I want to share with you is what I feel I can share with you without compromising any of our security uh, protocols. But I want to just let you know these exist and kind of what they do and where we're going with them. So what does it actually do? So if it's deployed, it would be deployed probably if it was a real situation by a front office receptionist person, one a person in the front office. When you deploy it, when you push the button, it is going to uh, secure the front door, the front door outside perimeter door. And it will secure all doors that are connected to the system via a card reader. So that's largely going to be all of your electrified doors. And I would emphasize, and I know we're still meeting in Mr. Barton's thunder for a later topic, but one of the most important things we work on are securing outside doors. And it's, uh, I will tell you as a former building principal, it's a full-time job. And sometimes having all the doors locked outside is an inconvenience, but it is really the first uh, line of defense uh, of taking care of people. And uh, we've gotten creative on how we keep doors locked when we have portables outside. The card readers, and you may have seen the card readers, those have been a great benefit for our, uh, our school district, including portables, working with them. And uh, the inside front office foyer door is already secured and locked. So if I push the button, it locks the outside perimeter door. It does notify, and I don't wanna go into too, much, too many details for security, but it notifies the personnel that are designated that the lockdown button has been activated by someone in the front office. And I will tell you that also we're looking at ways and Mr. Doug Holland is, is leading the charge on this to expand the ways we're able to notify people if we have to deploy the red uh, button. So we're working on that. And uh, we've also imp implemented lately, recently, because we do have turnover among staff with our front office staffs and all of our buildings, uh, a focus on what the button does, when it should be used, and what happens when I deploy the button. So that was a recent uh, refocusing. So we're excited about that. And uh, so these are the red buttons. And uh, if you have any um, input on the red buttons, Mr. Barton, Mr. Muir, Mr. Holland, Mr. King and I, myself are happy to take it and see what we can do. And if you don't have anything right now, you can always get with us later, so. Thank you, Mr. McCord. Any questions or comments on those um, emergency button operations? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. McCord. Appreciate that very much. Item four, receive information about and provide input regarding the school safety audits. Mr. Barton. Yeah, and this is, kind of, this is in line with one of the the major functions um, of the committee is to review reports that we send over to the school safety center. Um, last meeting, I believe, is one where we did review this large report that um, the information that we had to send over to the safety center regarding the, the three-year audit cycle for completing these audits for our facilities. So um, as for the committee, of course, it'll be three years before we have to review that again, but we are in the new cycle. We just began it this year in making sure that each one of our facilities receives um, a safety audit, which are completed by Michael Ferguson. He does a wonderful job. Um, 
we notice that when we go through there, it's really the same things that we that we thought. For for all purposes, we got some really solid buildings, thanks to uh, Mr. Foster and his team. Um, the human nature stuff is really what we run into. People stacking stuff too high, not following that, um, making sure paper on the wall, 3D art, et cetera, et cetera, the stuff that is just normal human nature stuff. So as we go through this and uh, if there's any information I can provide y'all on, on what it is that we're tasked to look for, it's a pretty comprehensive document. But from the committee's standpoint, do you all have any input? Is there anything that you feel that I need to pass on to Mr. Ferguson and then, of course, myself on what it is that we need to be looking for when we're auditing all of our facilities throughout the district in regard to safety? So this, this list here, uh, Mr. Barton, represents your, your most common findings. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's kind of just the things that if you walk into any school in America, not just Conroe ISD, those are the things that really you're going to run into um, with those locking mixtures. Like we talked about those exterior doors, which is a, is, is a thing that we want to make sure that we're dealing with, but we do find them. And then the storage height, keeping the combustibles secured appropriately bookshelves, secures to the walls, and then properly securing personal items. Those are kind of the big global ones that are found for the most part. And I know that, you know, the, the constant battle with exterior doors, you know, you mentioned locking there, but I think it falls in line, but it's the propping open yes. of exterior doors. Yes, that's that's what we find that that 25 cent wooden wedge, it's just convenience over safety, but communication um, throughout the past couple of years has, has tremendously decreased that, but it is still out there. So, sure. You know, Mr. Barton, I would just emphasize, and some of our other committee members may have some input, but you never cross the finish line on this. You're, you're always striving to improve and, and revisit and reemphasize. We try to do a good job of that, but there, there is no finish line. You're, you're always striving to get better on this. And that's why they do them. And so if anybody has any input on certain things that they would like us to be looking for, um, please let us know, because it's always good going into these particular audits armed with, hey, a, a safety and security committee meeting recommended that we look for these in the campus. Here's what we're finding. And um, we just want to make sure, of course, you know, our campuses are as safe for everyone that comes into them, including our kids. So any input would be valuable and appreciated. Mr. Barton, is there is there any way that we could? Uh, I know that no one has time, especially uh, right now. But we used to, as you know, take the photos, you know, take a snapshot of the camera showing the door wedged open. Will that do us any good at all with going to the campus and saying, "Okay, this is you, four days out of five a week, you know, for half a day." That would be valuable, but if anybody does have those pictures, I would ask that they're sent to me. And so then I can kind of compile that information and then be able to communicate with the campus accordingly. Um, that would be something that I would be more than happy to handle as long as it you know, came to me and you know, I was the one doing the communicating. And so they weren't getting hit from six or seven different areas, but yes. Mr. Holland, I would emphasize custodial and maintenance. They do a great job of letting us know and letting Mr. Barton and myself know when that occurs. And they're, they're, they are their boots on the ground and they're looking for it. It does happen if we correct it. Okay. Any other comments? Mr. Cord? Uh, yes. Dr. Bell, just a little historical perspective on that and to echo what Ethan's been saying is we've done these audits even before the state required them. And using that audit cycle was very productive in coming up with the idea for the red button, coming up with the idea of the controlled vegetable, a vegetable, and getting things in place and having identified our needs. And that a lot of that went into our safety and security package that Easy is now working on. So we we found those to be very beneficial to us over the years. And to piggyback on that, for example, uh, the the importance of keeping the exterior doors locked. That is a major positive consequences of the efforts, for example, of a specific school across the street at Conroe High that's uh, occurring right now. And uh, we're working towards, so uh, we have some, we have a couple of years of work ahead of us, but that will be a real positive after uh, the construction's done is being able to secure more exterior doors. 
I have a quick question. This is Amy Brown. I have a quick question just about the, we, we ask a lot of our receptionists, um, not just from a safety security standpoint, just all day long, what kind of training do we provide our receptionists in, in how to respond uh, in this type of situation? Captain Blakelock, the name of the training is off the top of my head right now. If you give me two seconds, it's emergency operation procedures for campus personnel. Is that the name of it? Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, it's, it's best practices for front office personnel. Yeah. There we go. Best practices. Yes. Are these and, actual drills that you guys do or is it just, you know, um, a module that they train on maybe on the computer or read through a handbook? It's actually a um, it's a classroom style training where we cover um, common issues that can be seen by front office staff as they approach the campus while they work throughout the day and as they leave the campus. And then best practices in if you have to call in an emergency, if you have to have to activate uh, any emergency system, then how best to do that. And um, we've trained uh, over the past several years. I, I couldn't even tell you. Um, how many people have attended this training? We've had people from every campus that work the front office. Um, and the police department's been doing this now for eight or nine years. And um, and outside of, of this year, of course, where we couldn't meet in person, um, we have actually offered this course. I would correct me if I'm wrong, Captain Blakelock, at least twice a semester. And then, of course, that will still continue. Absolutely. You know, and Amy, that is helpful. And I know on campus, I always tried to coach our people up in the front office who were fine individuals. I appreciated them so much, not just on what they did, but how they did it and the demeanor of which they carried it out. But based on your your input there, I think that will spiral back at a principal's meeting in the near future to talk about the demeanor and how, not just what they carry out, but how it's carried out, because that matters a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on then to item five. Receive information about and provide input regarding the multi-hazard emergency operations plan. Mr. Martin. Okay, yes, and this is the big function of the committee is to provide um, input and, and recommendations in regard to the district's um, multi-hazard emergency operation procedures. Now, we're very, we were fortunate, we were in the process of refreshing those when this committee was created. So at the beginning of this school year, you all, most of you had the opportunity to review that refresh and then ultimately approve it. Now, with that being said, it's going to need to be approved for the next school year. So um, after this meeting, what I'll do is I'll get with Ms. Blakelock and make sure that I have the correct list of emails. Uh, I will send out the current um, campus-based district EOP or MEOP that we have. And if you all can put your eyes on it, review it, provide any input, any changes that you would feel necessary, that would be great. Um, we would like input on anything that is in there um, in regard to those procedures. But of course, just ask that even though there's no secrets in there because we follow the standard response protocol, it is kind of a, a it's a Connor ISD document. So um, a kind of a for your eyes only thing, but definitely review, provide input because then the next, the next meeting of course will be um, where the committee will, will ultimately approve that document that we can redistribute out to all of our campuses so then they can make their campus-based MEOPs um, at the next meeting. Okay, any questions on that? When, when will you be bring, sending that out, Ethan? I will send it out um, after this meeting is over as soon as okay. I just confirm that all of the email addresses are correct. That'll be a quick, um, easy attachment to send out to everyone. And what is the deadline for when you need to have comment back to you? Um, let's see. March, April, and the next meeting I, it's, that has to occur during the summer. So, I mean, we'll just say May the 14th, and I'll put that in the email. That'll be a good date. Give everybody time to be able to put eyes on it, review it, and then uh, provide me any, in, any input and or feedback that they do have. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any questions on that? So, an email to follow with a deadline two weeks out. Uh, for feedback. 
Oh, May the 14th, not April. I'm sorry, May. yeah, May. Yeah. Yes, sir. Months out, not weeks out, months out. Uh, I was being optimistic, Ethan. I was ready to, like, put on the cap and gown and let's, let's get them walking across the stage here. I'm, I'm ready to get to May, I guess. Um, all right. Any other uh, comments or questions? All right, thank you. Well, that concludes um, all of our agenda items for today. Thank you once again for your willingness to be a part of the committee. Um, we will be scheduling, sir, do we have a date for the summer meeting yet? Or uh, Ethan, do we have one scheduled yet? Or we will be doing that uh, shortly. Yeah, I, we have not. We have not had discussion. We'll look at it and, and kind of see what what will fit the best within those particular months. I think last time we did it, what we didn't want them to do is jump and go back to back because I believe our last meeting was in August toward the beginning of the school year. So we didn't want to make sure we wanted to make sure that it wasn't in July. So they were hitting back to back. So I would probably say early mid summer, but we have not discussed an exact date yet. Okay. And, and I think the, there's the other reality is we are in a legislative session right now. And, and uh, you know, our first uh, topic today was a proposed bill. And, and so as we move through uh, these next few months, we will be seeing, you know, bills actually get approved and signed and become law. And that may affect um, some of our conversation moving forward as well. So um, we'll, we'll be watching that uh, as well. Yeah, any other comments today before we adjourn? All right. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate your time uh, this afternoon, and we will uh, get that email out to you very soon. Uh, and we'll look forward to, to seeing you all again this summer. So thank you very much.